Uh, welcome everyone to this uh, IWA Masterclass 3 webinar on methane monitoring, modeling, and mitigation. Uh, I'm Kesab Sharma, and I'm currently in Brisbane, Australia, working at the University of Queensland. And I'll be moderating uh, this webinar today. So before we start uh, uh, the webinar, we have got some housekeeping matters. Uh, IWA had got a, has got a climate smart utility COP. Uh, you can find this on IWA uh, Connect website. Uh, uh, please check the link at the bottom on the side there uh, to visit this uh, website. There's a very useful uh, website where, where uh, you can uh, join, uh, discuss, participate in various discussions. Uh, this is a platform to exchange ideas. Uh, talking about today's webinar, this webinar will be uh, recorded and it will be made available to all the participants on demand uh, on the IWA website. Also, the speakers uh, uh, will have some uh, responsibilities uh, for securing copyright permissions for any work uh, that they present here. Uh, and the, the, the views that are uh, presented in this webinar are, are, are the presenter's uh, views and they don't necessarily reflect IWA opinion. Uh, during the presentation or after the presentation, uh, you are welcome to have uh, your questions uh, to our, uh, our panel. Uh, please use Q&A box to, put your, to send your questions to the panelists. Uh, we will answer this uh, during the discussion and also at the end of this, uh, uh, towards the end of this webinar. Uh, the chat box, please do not put any question in chat box. So this is uh, uh, for the general request uh, only. Uh, we have got uh, five presentations today. Uh, sorry, uh, there are four presentations, uh, five presenters. Uh, they are very good uh, presentation and we'll go through this uh, presentation and uh, after each presentation there will be a very brief uh, q a session so each presentation will last for 10 minutes and followed by five minute q a uh, and also towards the very end we'll have 20 minutes time for uh, general discussion q and a uh, this is the agenda uh, for this webinar uh, now, these are the, the panel members for today's uh, webinar. Uh, myself, uh, Kesab Sharma, we have got Evelyn from Ghent University, Belgium. We got Anders from Karlstad, uh, Westward Treatment Plant in Sweden. We got Annette uh, from the same uh, Westward Treatment Plant in Sweden. We got Oriel from uh, Catalan Institute of Water Research in Spain. And we got John Willis from Brown and Caldwell, Caldwell uh, USA. Before we, we start our uh, webinar, uh, there will be a poll on your screen. Uh, there are two questions uh, on the poll. Please participate uh, in the poll and share your answers uh, with, with the panelists uh, of this webinar. Uh, we'll wait for a few minutes uh, before you complete the poll. Okay, we have got the, uh, the results uh, of this poll here. Number one question there was, do you think we can take action to reduce methane emission now? Uh, majority of us, almost everyone, 99% of the participants say yes to this. Yes, we can reduce the methane emission. Uh, second question was, what would you find useful to make progress? Uh, uh, most popular answer, there are two answers. The most popular one was tools to better estimate emissions. And second is, second one is, experience with monitoring methods. So there's the result uh, uh, from the poll. Uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for participating in this poll and expressing your views. Uh, before we move into uh, to the webinar, uh, please feel free to share your thoughts on social media. Uh, 
uh, you have got we have got this uh, report on quantification mo uh, and modeling of fugitive uh, greenhouse gas emission from urban water system uh, uh, that is published by IW recently. Uh, so, if you have got any thoughts on uh, on the issues uh, related to methane emissions from uh, uh, urban water systems, please uh, share your thoughts on social media. Use uh, tag at IWASQ on social media and also tell us what action you are taking to reduce methane emissions. Uh, the hashtag you could use is uh, IWA, etc. Okay, so today uh, the whole uh, webinar uh, is focusing on methane, methane emission from urban water system. We are talking about monitoring, modeling, and mitigation. So these are the areas uh, that will be covered in today's webinar. Uh, why are we talking about methane is because uh, the methane is highly potent glo global uh, uh, greenhouse gas with the global warming potential of 21 uh, over 100 years and 56 over 20 years. Uh, our first uh, speaker today is uh, Evelyn from Ghent University, Belgium. Evelyn is a full professor at the uh, Ghent University uh, leading the bio CO uh, research group. Our group has uh, a specific exper expertise in biological wastewater treatment, uh, considering innovative techniques and sustainability aspects such as greenhouse gas emissions. They do process engineering, aiming at process optimization through physical-based modeling and simulation, uh, data treatment techniques, and experimental studies. With this introduction, I would like to invite uh, Evelyn. Uh, to give a presentation. Your time is 10 minutes. Thank you very much, Sharma. I hope you can uh, uh, hear me well, uh, Keshap, sorry. Um, yes, thank you. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, everybody around the globe. Uh, it will be my pleasure to talk to you today about methane emissions from wastewater treatment plants, more specifically the quantification and mitigation. As we all know, wastewater treatment plants emit greenhouse gases. They emit CO2, which is associated to the plant's energy consumption, which is mainly for aeration. They emit N2O, which is a very potent greenhouse gas and mainly emitted during nitrification and denitrification, as you have already seen in the May webinar of this series. And then today we will be dealing with methane emissions from wastewater treatment plants. About 10 years ago, we performed the first full-scale, long-term online monitoring campaign measuring both nitrous oxide and methane emissions from a municipal wastewater treatment plant. You see the plant here. It was uh, the wastewater treatment plant uh, from Planning Severe near Rotterdam in the Netherlands. We measured for about one year. And if you look very well to this plant, of course, you immediately recognize the settlers. You also see uh, a lot of white on the other equipment, which is because this was a specific plant which was covered. It's close to um, housing facilities and it was uh, completely covered to be able to withdraw the off gas for treatment and you immediately um, yeah, understand that this gives us interesting perspectives for uh, monitoring greenhouse gases. The configuration of the wastewater plant we see on the next slide and um, the wastewater treatment plant has a primary settler and then biological treatment. It has been uh, revamped over the years. This is why it consists of a plug flow reactor followed by a carousel reactor and the plug flow reactor has a pre denitrification configuration. Both the primary and secondary sludges are sent to sludge treatment, which consists of a thickening process, anaerobic digestion, dewatering, and then cogeneration, so using uh, the biogas for energy production. Since the whole plant was covered, we were able to analyze the off gas of the entire plant using only two sampling points. This was very, this made our life much easier. The gas composition was measured with an online gas analyzer and the gas flow rates were measured with an anemometer. In order to be able to identify the sources and sinks of methane on the plant, we also wanted to set up mass balances over the different unit processes. So for this purpose, we had to calculate the methane load in every single liquid and gas stream from the flow rate and the concentrations. 
For measuring dissolved methane, we used a method based on sorting out the methane and analyzing the headspace of the recipient with gas chromatography. For the gas streams, we took the samples in gas bags and also analyzed them with the GC. And here, in the next slide, you see the overall results. Both the methane and the nitrous oxide emissions at this plant were quite high, and they exceeded the indirect CO2 emissions that were related to electricity consumption, so not to be neglected. Also, the emission factors for both compounds were higher than the emission factors which are put forward by the IPCC. And then we quantified the methane mass flow rates over all unit processes. And you can find uh, details in, described in the publication corresponding to this. Uh, I want to draw your attention to a few specific sources and sinks of methane. First of all, the sources. The main sources of methane, which you see on the next slide, were the sewer system, which was responsible for 25% of the total methane emission. So sewer system 25%, and then the unit processes related to anaerobic digestion, that was the other 75%. And you see the breakdown of the methane emissions for the individual unit processes uh, mentioned on the slide. In fact, it was a lot. 75% eh? of the methane emission comes from all the processes related to anaerobic digestion. This makes, if you make the calculation, that the amount of methane which is emitted uh, from processes that are, are related to biogas production may be potentially even higher than the CO2 that you avoid by using biogas. So this gives us something to think about and definitely a reason to take care of uh, the unit processes around um, anaerobic digestion, which is definitely one important point of mitigation. Besides methane sources, we also found a methane sink on the plant, namely the biological reactor. 80%, so that's quite a lot of the methane, which entered the biological reactor was converted. And we could identify that the conversion took place in the aerated part of the biological tank. It was performed by aerobic methane oxidizing bacteria, which I will further refer to as methanotrophs. So that is great. Methane can be converted. And this is definitely something we want to exploit. Therefore, in the next part of our study, we investigated which operational and design conditions could promote methane conversion over stripping. And we did this through mathematical modeling and simulation. We started from the activated sludge model number one that most of you know, at least the ones who are modeling. Uh, ASM1 describes COD and nitrogen removal in activated sludge and we extended it with aerobic growth and decay of methanotrophs. We assumed uh, that they followed monokinetics and we took parameter values from literatures. We call the resulting model ASM1M. ASM1M was then implemented in BSM1, which is a virtual wastewater treatment plant with a pre-denitrification configuration. It consists of two anoxic uh, reactors and three aerobic uh, reactors in series, the mimicking a plug flow system. For the reference case in the study, we replaced the three aerobic tanks by a single continuous stirred tank reactor, which is thus completely mixed. We also included in the model an appropriate description of the gas liquid transfer. And then the result. First of all, we compared two process configurations the single aerobic tank, which is completely mixed, CSTR, and then the plug flow modeled as three completely mixed tanks in series, which had the same aerobic volume in total as the CSTR had. The graphs show the percentage of the incoming methane, which is stripped in blue, which is emitted in reddish and converted in green. So this is what we want, we want the green. We see it for the overall plant in the pie chart, and we also see the results for the separate reactors as bar charts. And you see in the pie chart that the completely mixed configuration performs much better 
with regard to methane conversion, that's the green part in the pie chart on the top, much better than the one uh, for the plug flow reactor. The plug flow reactor is less good. How can we explain this? Well, in fact, a plug flow configuration has a higher inlet substrate concentration. So a uh, higher substrate concentration at the inlet means that you need higher oxygen at that point. So you will provide more aeration air. This also makes that you have a uh, higher, so that the aim is to provide more oxygen, a higher li gas liquid transfer rate of oxygen, but it also makes that you have a higher liquid gas transfer rate of methane. So more stripping. As a result, in the plug flow reactor, you have more stripping and less methane conversion than in a completely mixed reactor. In terms of methane conversion, this is thus uh, less good. This is, by the way, also something that we examined uh, later on uh, for um, SBR types of systems of uh, um, like in granular sludge, where you also have this plug flow system and high oxygen uh, demand on, at the beginning uh, is then not very beneficial. Uh, as a next uh, parameter, we investigated the effect of the aeration intensity as such. The upper graph shows the percentage of the incoming methane which is stripped, converted, and discharged with the effluent. The lower graph shows the effluent concentrations in terms of organic carbon, COD, um, ammonium, and methane. And we see that the optimal aeration intensity for methane conversion corresponds with the one for ensuring a good effluent quality in terms of COD and ammonium. So this is very good news. Of course, a small fraction of the air that you use for aeration will also be used for methane um, conversion. We calculated that this was about three and a half percent. And then last, we investigated the effect of the depth of the aeration equipment. The graph shows the percentage of the entering methane again, which is stripped in blue, converted in green, and uh, discharged with the effluent in red for different depths of the aeration equipment. If zero meter means, you have sub sur means that you have surface aeration, four meter, quite regular, and eight meter, then a very deep uh, reactor. The equation which was used to calculate the gas liquid transfer of methane and oxygen takes into account uh, different effects which are counteracting. First of all, you have a higher partial pressure at greater depths, which means that you have then a better solubility of methane and oxygen. Second effect is that there is depletion as the gas bubble rises, so there is less oxygen present to convert the methane. So quite some interactions which you can ideally describe with modeling, but overall we found that for deeper aeration we get less methane stripping and a higher methane conversion efficiency. That brings me to my uh, take-home messages of today. We have quantified methane emissions from wastewater treatment plants. Um, the magnitude I presented, the dynamics I didn't present today, but in fact for methane, there were not so much uh, seasonal dynamics. Uh, what we did to this end, we've used fit for purpose monitoring methods. And I was uh, yeah, uh, happy to see that you all agreed that good monitoring methods are really key for us uh, to mitigate methane emissions. I, I definitely agree with that. So what we uh, described in one of these papers is a, um, a refinement of a salting out method for measuring dissolved methane, in case you need that. We also identified sinks and sources of methane, and we have proposed some mitigation options. Thank you for your attention. Um, before I leave uh, the floor, I want to also thank in particular uh, Matthijs Dahlman, who is uh, the joint PhD student who has performed most of the work that I have been presenting today. Um, it was my pleasure to guide uh, Matthijs uh, together with Mark van Roosrecht from TU Delft. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Evelyn, for a nice uh, presentation, very informative one. So we got a few minutes for question and answer. Uh, Evelyn, there's a question uh, on Q&A board. Yes, uh, I see that from whom? Yep. Boy, um, is anaerobic, an anaerobic CSTR a good way to model the methane emissions from the sludge storage tanks or are there better ways? Um, we, well, 
first of all, in what I presented today, we did not model uh, the storage tank, but uh, not uh, we did it in other uh, studies. It's definitely uh, something relevant. Uh, it is indeed so that 75% uh, of methane emissions that you get from uh, sludge treatment is mainly due to the storage uh, before and after uh, the before and after the, the anaerobic digestion. So if you could cover those storage tanks, that would already uh, solve a lot of problems in terms of mitigation. If you want to model how much is there, um, I would say, yeah, depending on the configuration that you have, eh, if it is if, if it is anoxy, usually you don't provide any oxygen there. So it would say indeed, uh, um, it is anaerobic. Is it a CSTR? In most cases, I would say, Probably yes, this depends on the mixing there. It is definitely also the, the, um, the, the way that I would model it. Um, and uh, what you typically do is then you take the anaerobic digestion model uh, and you model it as if it's an anaerobic digestion process. If there would be some oxygen present, you could include a bit of gas liquid transfer there, indeed. Okay, Shall I, I hope that answers the question. I will go to a next one that I see. Um, Please, uh, catch up. tell me when, when to stop. Huh? And yeah, so, sure, that's another question. <laughs> and the results right. only cor corresponds to covered facilities, right? If not, could you please comment? Well, first of all, indeed, the fact that the facility was covered made our life much easier in terms of quantifying the overall emissions. Uh, that, that's clear. Other, uh, we could simply use one of the off-gas pipes and, and measure. Otherwise, what you would need to do is to use a floating hood and then preferably also uh, measure at different places uh, in the plant and try to uh, make some overall calculation in that way. However, the results that we presented for the unit process are completely independent of the process being covered or not. Uh, it's a bit easier. To, to, to measure the off-gas, but otherwise you could also measure dissolved oxygen concentrations in different um, unit processes. And as for the conclusions, uh, sinks and sources uh, of methane emissions, I would say there is no reason to believe, uh, no reason whatsoever why they would be different for non-covered facilities. Um, so the, the fact that uh, methane, uh, um, that sludge storage co contributes to methane, that's a clear one. Um, yeah, the, the fact that you have conversion in the aerobic tank is also not related to the fact that this tank is covered. Eh? Um, it's, it's because it's, 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 it has to do with the amount of dissolved oxygen that is, uh, sorry, dissolved methane that enters the biological reactor. Are oh, there a few more questions? <laughs> yes, um, do you have a preference? Um, Ah, yes, that's a, a bit of a technical one from, uh, I'm just answering them in chronological questions. How was the methane produced in anaerobic processes sent back to the aerobic uh, reactors? Um, if you look at the slide, I'm not sure if I can go there, the slide of the plant configuration, you will see that there is a, an off gas uh, withdrawal from the plants. And then it's sent back uh, to it, it's yeah it's earlier one of the previous slides. Well, if if you do, it's it's also dis discussed in detail in the paper, but it's so that all, the whole off gas of the plant is taken and it is then sent to um, the biological reactors where it is used for aeration, and then afterwards it's taken from the aerobic reactors and then sent to a compost filter before it is released. Yep. I'm afraid that we are running out of time now, so we may have to wait until uh, we have got another session for question and answer at the end. Uh, uh, thank you, Evelyn, for your presentation. There are some questions uh, coming in chat box as well. I would like to remind everyone that please put your questions in Q&A box uh, so that it's easier for us to, to, to monitor and follow. Uh, we'll, we'll, uh, there, are, uh, some of the, there are some outstanding questions is still there, so we'll come to that questions uh, uh, later in the, in the session. Thank you, Evelyn. Thank you. Uh, now we'll move to our next uh, presentation uh, on monitoring methane within EGMET. Uh, we have two presenters here, Anders and Annette. Uh, uh, Anders is a consultant at NATOVES AV. He has been appointed uh, responsible for AGMED, the Swedish voluntary system for monitoring methane from biogas facilities. He's also a methane measurement consultant within AGMED 
and for biogas plants that needs to measure under the environmental code. Annette is a compliance manager at a biogas facility situated at a municipal wastewater treatment plant in Karlstad, Sweden. She is responsible for the production of biomethane as vehicle fuel. Uh, earlier, she, ha she has worked with uh, landfill gas at a municipal waste facility. Uh, with this introduction, I would like to invite uh, Anders and Anna to, to give your presentation. Thank you. And I will start and Annette will take over in a little while. Um, you can take the next slide. Uh, EGMET is a system that all uh, biogas plants in Sweden is invited to join, uh, where we try to make a system out of measuring methane and mitigate its emissions in, in a systematic way. It is Svenskt Vatten and Afal Sverige, trade organizations for waste and for wastewater treatment that has started this system. Um, and they have appointed me, uh, I'm a consultant at firm called Nitovas to manage the system. Uh, I also do measuring measuring quantifications within EGMET as part of my, my work. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this system, uh, it, uh, as of right now, about half of the production of biogas is done by plants that is member of the IGMET system, and we've been active for about two years. So, of course, we hope to have more uh, facilities joined, so we uh, include all, all the facilities, of course. Uh, but what we do within the system is try to systematically reduce methane emissions by uh, first, uh, systematic leak detection and helping plants to do this in, in uh, do leak detection and repair in a, an, in a systematic way. This is performed by the staff, but they get support from EGMET uh, in their efforts. Uh, and Annette, Annette will be describing uh, um, how they do this in the plant. Um, the next part of AMET is emission quantification, which is done uh, by an external consultant, and I'm one of those. Um, and we do this, um, um, so, so I will be talking more about emission quantification uh, la later on. Uh, next slide, please. First, a little bit about the leak detection, the, the um, rules within the system so that you know what, what, what we try to achieve. Uh, we want our members to do a very thorough check on the facility every year. Uh, this is not very often, but we think it is enough to do a thorough check every year because we then do a less, uh, um, a, a check that is more uh, um, in, in specific points where we can detect if there is, um, ha has arisen leakages during the period from the last check. And if there is leakages, then of course we, we detect it and we go in and, and, and try to remediate and, and find the exact sources and, 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 and um, reduce the, the emissions, of course. Uh, as, and and these, this is done by the facilities. What we do as a consultant is to check the measurements and see it, if it corresponds to the values we uh, achieve when we do the quantification, uh, uh, which I will be describing later. Uh, one tool that is very efficient, we think, is to use uh, the right equipment. Uh, and I, I will be describing what kind of leakage uh, 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 instruments we, we prefer in EGMIT, but also to do these simple measures like knowing then when then that then what you have uh, um, rust and stuff that you know that here we might have an emission and search for it more thoroughly in, in those places. And the upper picture uh, that we uh, encourage our members to uh, do as the picture says, to uh, have simple ways of easily uh, um, monitor leakages. Uh, and I have already kind of talked about this 
looking, looking for rust, leak detection spray, leak detection instruments. And if you have a big company and big many leakages, you can employ the IR camera as, as a way to uh, um, visualize where you have your leakages. Uh, the facilities themselves, we encourage them to use a semiconductor sensor because it has a low detection limit. It is therefore possible to measure in a room uh, and see if you have a high, if, if the um, amount of gases have risen from recent measurements, then you can detect it with these semiconductor sensors because they have low detection limit and they have a short um, time frame for reaching the value that is, is accurate. So choose a good leak detection instrument and you will save time. Now, Annette. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about how, how we do it here uh, on site uh, with the leak, and detec leak detection and repair. And uh, this slide shows a, a part of one of the protocols we have for leak detection. And um, according to regulations, we are obliged to do this at least four times a year. Uh, but in reality, we do it more often, uh, but we don't. Uh, we don't put it in a document like this. Uh, it's not logged in a protocol. But every time we, we have uh, had a stop uh, somewhere and, and we start all over again, we can go all over uh, to find leaks if there is any and stop again and start all over until uh, it is uh, seat. Uh, so the leak detection, as Anders has uh, talked about, is carried out with a handheld in instrument with a semiconductor sensor on a flexible um, measuring hose. Um, uh, you've seen pictures. And uh, a leak detection spray is also used. And we do measuring uh, at uh, where there are um, gas couplings, uh, flanges, valves, and also sludge hatches. And if we find any leakage, uh, uh, we mark it as red in the protocol. And uh, if it's somewhere not so obvious, a nameplate is put up and, and as close as possible to the leakage point. And when suitable, repair is done with sealant of different kinds. Uh, and when tightening is needed, we have uh, spark-free tools for that. Uh, so here's the, the second slide uh, shown with pictures of the uh, two measuring places. And to the left, you see a condensation or condens condensation vessels with the couplings, flanges and valves. And to the right, you see uh, the sludge hatches on top of the digester uh, where there can be leakage around the edges. And uh, that is repaired by using sealant or uh, thread locking. And thanks for me. Back to you, Anders. Thank you, Annette. Uh, my part of this process is the quantification uh, done in, in all, all the plants every third year. Um, and we've all, always all, already touched with the, the issue of standardization, with the issue of choosing the right methods. We have uh, a book called Handbook Metanmätningar. I don't think it's in English, uh, but uh, it, it is... Um, the book that describes how we are supposed to carry out our measurements. Uh, we have different firms doing quantification, but all use the same, um, the same standardized method. Uh, we also use the same standardized reporting and calculation. Uh, and we try to, when we do the measurements, differ between pre-treatment measurements, measurements on pre-treatment processes, measurement on gas systems, and measurements on digestate, digestate treatment, because uh, the reporting then can be used in the statistics in, in a more efficient way. And it is also possible to, to use the data to uh, report back to the facilities uh, 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 where we um, um, compare with other facilities and, and their, their uh, um, 
what what they have, what kind of missions they have in these three areas. Uh, and then, of course, we do a summary of the total, and we deliver measure reducing measure measures to the facilities. What we think from our experience is the best way to reduce methane in their uh, in their facility. And quantification, of course, means that we have to measure the concentration and the flow, uh, uh, and we do it over time. We have we take our equipment with us. We don't measure. Um, Short periods we measured up up to an hour in each point to be certain that uh, uh, any uh, variations is is caught in in the measurement and if if uh, there are processes that could result in in varying um, varying uh, degrees of emissions then we include this in our measurement. Next, please. Uh, as you can see here, just one example of a measurement where it was important to uh, um, measure different passes in the process to be able to calculate the right mission over time. Next, please. And as I said, we bring our equipment with us to be able to measure over time. And, and the, the um, method that we have chosen within AGMET is the feed. Um, ionization detector with a cutter for methane. So it filters away all the hydrocarbons. Uh, the, the feed measures all, uh, as, as an instrument measures all hydrocarbons, but we filter away all other we, we do with a filter and then we get the result in methane. There are other good me me measures, but measurement uh, methods, but, but we have chosen and said that within we should use the feed, the flame ionization detector. Next, please. And of course, we have to measure flow, which is often the most difficult part to get a good result. Uh, we do with differential pressure gig or hot wire sensor, uh, two different methods that we are allowed to use. Uh, sometimes uh, it is impossible. Um, we have explosion zones, for instance, where we cannot bring our measurement equipment uh, uh, by law. And then we have to use fan data, or for some instances where we have low flows, it is allowed to use standard values within the handbook methane methmer. So what we reach is the methane emission factors uh, that uh, was presented in the earlier presentation also. Uh, the percentage of methane related to the amount of methane produced at a facility. And this makes it possible to com compare different facilities with each other. Each other. Uh, next. This is an example. Uh, this is the quantification pro protocol and the numbers are, are of course, example, examples from a, a, a facility, but it, it um, shows you that this is standardized all the way through. The mathematics is done by, by a, a certain protocol. All the um, participant uh, quantifica uh, consultants do it the same way. So we put in the um, concentration value, the differential pressure from the differential gog, and, and the pipe diameter, uh, and uh, some constants. And then we calculate the uh, amount of gas, the amount of methane that is um, emitted from this specific source. And then uh, with the facilities total methane produced over the year, we calculate the percentage, the methane emission factor. We have different kind of emission sources that we measure. We have point emissions and we have diffusion emissions. The point emissions is often we often try to measure in ventilation shocks, different kind. Uh, general ventilation and process ventilation is two different kinds. Uh, the general ventilation uh, we, we must uh, measure, of course, and, and then the process ventilation where we, for instance, is connected to a certain certain um, a centrifuge or something where, where we think that we have emissions. Uh, diffuse emissions. Then we need to have a hood or some kind of collection of, uh, device. 
uh, uh, to be able to measure. Uh, we have also uh, understood that uh, these emissions cannot be easily compared between facilities because uh, there are so many factors involved in how much uh, emissions we actually uh, measure at one time and, and, and at another time it can be a completely different value. So we have more difficulties in how to use the, the, the data from diffuse emission sources, but we are working on it. Next, please. Uh, ventilation, here we have uh, the kind of measurements that are quite easy to do. Uh, we measure from pretreatment, from buildings, from ventilation from buildings where sludge is handled, uh, from hygienization units. Hygienization units can vary very much over time, so we have to measure them quite thoroughly. Uh, we do in um, gas equipment rooms, often quite low values, but some facilities we can detect very high values, but generally very low values. Gas holders, the same thing. Some gas holders emit enorm enormously amounts of methane, actually. Uh, others don't. Uh, and therefore, it's a good idea to monitor the gas holders thoroughly to, to be able to mediate. Post treatment. Uh, here we have often the big, the big sources of emissions, but also the the, the sources that are difficult to uh, have um, good measures to to um, um, to reduce. As I said, uh, the emissions of diffuse emissions is a, a big a big problem for us in a way that we think that as of today we have only done measurements we have not uh, and the data is is uh, should be used in a different way than we have done so far uh, and therefore we we don't do not include it in our um, uh, um, statistics because we need to use the data in a different way and I think uh, we believe that mathematic modeling, is with the data is is the way to go forward, but we haven't uh, reached that yet, unfortunately. It's the next focus area of ours. Uh, sources where we have found big emissions is the post treatment. We if if we have systems that are not connected to the gas system, then we have uh, can have very big emissions from post treatment. Uh, another area where we have seen historically big emissions is from uh, biogas upgrading units. Uh, the residual gas can vary very much between facilities. Uh, it, it can vary um, both within, within certain techniques because of um, process disturbances. Um, and it's therefore important to measure quite often. Uh, these facilities often measure more often than every third year because of um, environmental code. Um, and um, uh, so, but uh, we have also seen that during the years that EGMAT and previous systems have been existing, that we have reached lower and lower emissions from gas purification and, and gas um, upgrading units. Just some examples of how we present our data to the facilities first, and I won't, won't go into detail, but you can see that we measure for quite a long time, up to an hour, uh, and uh, we, we measure different ventilation uh, ventilation within the, the facilities. Uh, next, please. And then we use the data to measure the flow of methane uh, and the uh, the, the percentage part, the, the methane emission factors, as it's called, also for these different areas in the facility. And on the bottom row, you see the upgrading unit, the results from the upgrading unit, ventilation and uh, um, process gases, uh, rest gas process gases. Uh, process gases has historically been the big issue, but we also see that many plants may be not as thorough with their leaks, uh, leak detections and can have quite quite a big 
emission from ventilation. This is a compil compilation of results, uh, and I will leave it to you to to study it if, if you want to. But I can take some some pieces out of it to to show you. Uh, you have the biggest emissions noted here in non-gas type storage tanks. This is post treatment, as I talked about, a big emission source. Uh, you also have quite a lot from water scrubbing. This is known historically, uh, and, and it's, it's just a fact. Uh, but also from CHP units, the, the, when you, when you um, produce electricity from the gas. Uh, BUU stands for air gas upgrading, and CHP stands for electricity producing units. Uh, leakages, as you see, can be quite, quite high numbers in certain areas, but often it is from when you have an upgrading unit, higher pressures, more emissions. This is a compilation of results from the BUU units and shows you a little bit about how different uh, kind of upgrading units stand with regards to emissions. Uh, we can see that the chemical, uh, the I mean scrubber, the chemical scrubber are quite good with regard to emissions, uh, but within them you can have quite uh, big differences because of uh, how they from them, how, how they uh, use them over time. Um, we have the water scrubber quite, on the other hand, quite large emissions. And even and, and there, it is also, also possible to mediate the, the emissions by the way you, you run the facility. Uh, the PSR has had very quite numbers uh, previously, but gone down quite a bit in, in the Swedish measurements. Mm -hmm. Uh, because new processes, better processes. Um, and that was all for me. Thank you. Well, thank you, Anders and Annette, uh, for the uh, great presentation. <coughs> uh, we didn't really have much time left, but I think we can probably take uh, one or two questions, if there are any. Uh, I don't really see any questions in the Q&A box. Uh, at the moment, so we'll wait until we we come to that uh, uh, discussion session at the end of this uh, webinar. Uh, okay, so we move to our next uh, next presentation. This presentation is on methane generation and quantification from sewers. Uh, the speaker is Oriel Guterres. Uh, Oriel is a research fellow at the Catalan Institute of Water Research in Girona. He is an expert in urban sanitation systems, including urban sewerage and drainage, uh, development of innovative solutions and digitization of urban water systems. Uh, Oriel has more than 15 years of experience and research leadership in uh, sewer systems. Uh, with this brief introduction, I would like to invite Oriel to give a presentation. Oriel. Thank you very much, Kisha, for the introduction. And, uh... Yeah, uh, in my presentation today, I will talk a little bit about uh, yeah what happened with the methane in, in sewer systems, right? So the outline of the presentation has these different four points. The first, a little bit of context of sewer systems, the biological reactions that occur and they produce the methane in, in these specific sections of the room wastewater system, which factors affect the methane production, and a little bit of introduction of quantification because John Willis in the next presentation will elaborate a little bit further more on this topic. But let's start to, with this a slide, which is one of the slides that uh, it's on the report that uh, we publish, and I encourage you to, report, to read the report because all the information of this presentation is over there a little bit more extended. So we've seen that uh, methane is being produced in different places of the urban wastewater systems. Evelyn has explained which are the different contribution and it's, it's it's, uh, well, it was good to see that uh, in her case, 25% comes from this initial part, which is the, the sewer system. So 25% is not uh, neglectable. So my presentation is going to be focusing on these sections of the urban wastewater system, which is the sewer systems. Sewer systems, by definition, it's a very, it's a crucial section of the urban wastewater system that what its main function is 
transport the wastewater that is generated in so many different places down to the wastewater treatment plant, okay? And, uh, well, depending on the configuration of this uh, sewer network, in the, there are sections where the methane can be formed and uh, stripped. And just for you to have a, a, a number or a, a sense of the magnitude of these uh, installations, uh, in Spain, the length of the sewer network is this number here. 189,000 kilometers. Like if you put all the sewer networks, all the pipes, pumps, stations, manholes, everything all together in one line, it can have like this extension, which for you to take as a reference is two times the uh, equator line. Okay, so two times a loop in, in the whole planet. So you can see, and that's only for Spain, like different countries like the United States, Germany, developed countries. So it, it, it's case-based, it can change a little bit, but it has a big, big magnitude and transport a lot of sewage. And it has a big, big value in terms also in asset value for the for the urban wastewater system, okay? So what happens in this uh, transport, the wastewater from the its origin to the wastewater treatment plants? So um, in some sections of the sewer systems, they can prevail anaerobic conditions, anaerobic conditions can occur. And then these biological reactions that they are the ones that transport the organic matter that is contained in the wastewater down to biogas. Um, I, as I said, this is already more well explained in the, in the book, but this, this four step where the, the um, organic matter, the big compounds are break down and uh, transform to uh, methane and CO2 at the end, okay? So in sewer systems, we can, uh, this thing happen in specific places. And this is, a, as I said, is a biological uh, transformation of organic matter to methane. And this process, this biological process is very much linked with another process that happens in sewer systems, which is the reduction of sulfate to sulfide. H2S, okay? So these two different biological reactions happen simultaneously, and the two different biological communities help each other to produce uh, these two different compounds. Also in this slide, we have like a small simplification of how the sewer systems and the sewer networks uh, work. We have mainly two different, uh, depending on the slope and the configuration of the network, we have two different cases. The first one is these sections where uh, we call usually rising mains, and it's where the wastewater is transported from a lower point to a higher point. And this is characterized to be like pipes fully full with no head space. And in these conditions, there is no oxygenation, there's no aeration, so anaerobic conditions can happen. And when this happens, is a, one of the primary spots, one of the primary places where the, the biofilms that they can produce methane and, so, and sulfide, they grow. And in the slide, we can see that these biofilms, they grow attached to the sewer walls inside the pipes. They need a physical support. So they are attached to the pipes and they take the sulfate and the organic matter that is uh, in the wastewater to perform their metabolism. And they expose, they uh, create this uh, sulfide and methane that then it's dissolved in the, in the wastewater that is being transferred, okay? So here in this pump, in this rising make sections is the specific place where these compounds are generated. But these compounds, they are problematic when they are uh, released to the atmosphere. And that happens in this next sections when we have like manholes or gravity sewers or wet well discharge manhole, when the, the pipe uh, moves from being completely full to have uh, a gas phase. There is a little bit of gas phase and that those compounds are stripping this is where their contribution is like uh, detrimental, okay? So we have two different situations, the gravity sewers and the rising main sewers or pressured pipes. So generation of these compounds occur here and release a stripping. And when these compounds create the troubles uh, are here in these gravity sections or wet well manholes, okay? So, and uh, how does that happen? Uh, we performed studies uh, already a few years ago and to see how these two different biofilms and biological communities interact. And we saw that this uh, methane production was possible thanks to a uh, uh, thing called that we call it stratification. So which is the different location of these communities within the biofilm, okay? I'm gonna try to explain this in this slide. So here on the left-hand side, we have the, uh, a section of a pipe and this, Brown here is like uh, the sewer biofilm, which is about a few millimeters thick, okay? So 
in this part of the slide, we have like a section of the, this biofilm. This is the substratum, this is the pipe, and this top part here is the water. Okay, so all these things is this uh, phenomenon, the, the biofilm. So what happened with this biofilm is like the sulfate reducing bacteria, sulfate reducing bacteria, sorry, the bacteria that is able to use this sulfate, they tend to sit on the outer parts of the biofilm, okay, on the external parts. And the sulfate has been consumed in these parts and it's been released back to the liquid phase in terms of sulfide, okay? And uh, in the lower parts, in the inner parts of the, of the biofilm, it's where the methanogens, the methanogen archaea, they tend to be there because they are more sensible. They are not as strong as the sulfide bacteria. So this is a specific uh, configuration. This helps to protect the methanogen archaea. And because of the uh, solubility and the transfer of organic matter can go all the way through the biofilm, they're still there and they are able to get their food and they transform this organic matter back to methane, which is exposed in the, in the liquid phase, okay? Here on the lower part of the screen, we have like um, a couple of uh, images where uh, we uh, perform experiments to quantify which are the, where they were sitting the different sulfate reducing bacteria, which is this part and the uh, methanogens. And uh, here you can see, this is like uh, the biofilm surface and how the deeper that we go to the biofilm. So we divide it in five different layers. This is like millimeter layers. And we see that the higher the, the intensity of the green color is the higher it's the presence of this uh, uh, sulfide reducing bacteria. So as, as I was explaining here, they tend to sit on the top part on the outer sections of the outer sections of the biofilms and the methanogens with different methanogenic uh, archaea that we analyze, we saw that they were tend to sit in the lower part. So this combination and this stratification help to be there simultaneously and produce these two different compounds at the same time. Okay, yes, I, I will go fast with this one because uh, the main message of this slide is like not only in the sewer biofilm walls the, is where the sulfide and methane can be produced, there is places in the, in the sewer systems where the sediments tend to sit and the same conditions of uh, uh, anaerobic conditions and release of methane can happen. And there are also spots, hot spots for methane production in, from sewer systems, okay? So, which are the factors that affect the methane generation uh, from sewers? So we have them listed here in this slide, and uh, I'm going to explain a little bit one by one, very briefly. The first one is the dissolved oxygen. Obviously, the methane generation happens in uh, anaerobic conditions, so any uh, access or any exposure to oxygen uh, to the methanogenic archaea is not good for them. They don't like it. So that's why they tend to sit on the, on the lower parts of the biofilm, and that's, uh, that allows them to, to perform this uh, methanogenic activity, to, to have uh, methane production. Okay? So, and that's why methane uh, production happens more in rising main systems, because there is no oxygen there, there's no uh, uh, headspace, there is no radiation. There are more favorable conditions for them. The second one also is very obvious. We need to have like organic matter in the wastewater, and that's something that uh, happens everywhere. There is no limitation of uh, organic matter, so they need to have like COD or volatile fatty acids. Depending, volatile fatty acids are more easily biodegradable, so it's uh, their favorite food. Okay, the third factor is the something that we call hydraulic retention time, and this is the time of uh, contact between the biofilms and the wastewater, which is moving through the pipe, okay? So the higher the time that the wastewater is in contact with these biofilms, the more methane that we will have in this, uh, in this dissolved uh, wastewater because the, the methanogens, they are taking organic matter and bringing back the methane. So if the water goes past in the sewer systems, they the, the final uh, concentration of more methane is gonna be lower than if the water stays there and sits for a longer times and the concentrations increase. So that's a, yeah, quite uh, logic, quite simple, okay? So that's about the hydraulic retention time. The second last one factor is what we call also the area to volume ratio. And that is related to the, the diameter of the pipes, okay? So in small diameter pipes, we have a volume of water which sits here. And this small volume of water can be in contact of the area of the biofilm. So um, the biofilm can access to Mostly, mostly of the, water, the wastewater that is there. And that happens in upstream sections of the sewer systems when it have smaller pipes, connections from the households, etc. But as we go down to the sewer systems and we have like bigger diameters of pipes, big pipes, um, 
the area to volume ratio decreases. And we have, even though we have a little bit more area, there is a big volume of wastewater that is not directly exposed to the biofilms. So the ratio of this is another factor that, uh, that makes that we have more methane or less methane in dissolved in the, in the sewer systems. And finally, one uh, another factor which is very obvious is like the temperature. And even though it's very obvious, it, not, it has not been uh, thoroughly studied yet. And um, the logic is that um, the biofilms they grow like in they like warm temperatures. Okay, that's uh, commonly known. But we don't know the extent of these higher and lower temperatures. If it's uh, uh, how it in influences the production of methane. But that's definitely one of the main factors that affects their production in sewer systems. Okay, and. Um, Finally, just one slide to talk about this uh, methane quantification from sewers. Okay, as you might guess, the quantification on, of methane in sewer systems, it's complicated because of the extension and the different points of emissions and generation and all of these things that I have just introduced in my presentation, okay? Here in this slide, I'm showing you like the ideal sampling points and the ways that or the places that you should Meth measure methane if you want to have like a good assessment and close the, the, the mass balance to see how much methane is being produced in one section. So in rising main stations, you will have to sample here, sample here, know the stretch of the pipe and the flows, etc. which is maybe a little bit more uh, easier, but in gravity sections, the complication is much, much higher and you have multiple sampling points with air flow measurements, water flow measurements, so it's, it's not tricky. And in addition to this, there is no yet still a method that allow us to measure directly this off so far. So we have to take samples, take the samples, as also Evelyn mentioned in their methodologies, and then bring these samples to the GC and have uh, uh, the results and calculate back what was the concentration in the result phase. So there is still a lot of limitations on, uh, on this place. And... Uh, um, yeah, we are working hard to, to address all these knowledge gaps and limitations. So the conclusions of my presentation to that is like uh, yeah, sewer systems are sections of the urban water system where methane is being produced. We, we have seen this and we are studying this. Uh, we saw the difference between the generation and the expression of these places in the, in the network. We explained the biothermal stratification's influence and which are the factors that affect the methane production. And uh, as I said, the quantification is uh, tricky, it's possible, but we are studying and we are developing new tools and new assessment based on modeling and uh, uh, comprehensive uh, monitorings to, to, to perform this, uh, have uh, more accurate quantifications and emissions assessments of it from CWAS. And John will elaborate a little bit more in, in his presentation next. So that's it for me. If uh, you have any questions, I will be happy to reply uh, possible. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Oriel, for a very informative presentation. Uh, we have got a few minutes left. Uh, so we got a few questions waiting for your uh, response, mm. Oriel. Yes. Um, so I should go down to this. Yes, sir. Can the questions are the can, can you help a little bit with the questions? Can you read it? Because I don't know about the Q&A, which are the ones that I should be replying. Ah, okay, yeah. Uh, Currently, IPCC, the last two. IPCC, yes, the last two, thank you. IPCC does consider methane emissions from sewers. Um, do you think that we underestimate them for overall emissions from wastewater management? Okay, we definitely underestimate emissions from methane uh, sewers. In the previous, um, IPCC reports, they were not considered, but uh, I'm not sure about the last one, but definitely with the work that we are carrying out, we are showing that uh, this is uh, not a ne neglectable number. Uh, Evelyn said like 25% in that case, it was at the inlet of the wastewater treatment plant, and we don't know what happened a little bit upstream in the sections of the network, so that could be a further uh, extra contribution, so definitely um, we are underestimating this. Um, and there was another question about the higher area to volume ratio we get more or less of methane emissions. Okay. Um, with, 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 the smaller, uh, with the smaller diameter pipes, you have more contact between the biofilms and the uh, wastewater, but 
because they are smaller, they tend to have, uh, have like lower also methane um, methane production. So called. even though all the way all the wastewater is in contact with the biofilm, they can produce methane, but they they tend to be like small pipes in the upstream parts of the sections. In the lower pipes and with higher diameters, they have less contact between the water and the volume. But because the biofilm is like a, a, you have more area of biofilm, like in uh, overall numbers, they could have also a major uh, contribution in terms of methane of the, uh, the absolute numbers of methane. So that's that's a little bit. Uh, it it depends a lot in case specific situations also. Yeah? But the the rule of thumb is uh, more or less what I just replied. Uh, thank you very much. I'm afraid we have to stop here because we didn't. We are running yeah, out of time. Sure. Uh, we still have one more presentation to go. Uh, the next presenter is John Willis. Uh, he will be talking about uh, significance of sewer methane uh, and then some opportunities to quantify and reduce recover of methane from sewers. So that's his topic. John is uh, vice president with Brown and Caldwell and is a uh, WEF uh, fellow uh, with 30 year, 32 years uh, experience in attacking waste for energy and unrecovered resources within the wastewater space. Uh, he recently chaired uh, WEF's Bar Solid Committee and vice chaired WEF's uh, PFAS Task Force. Uh, recently completed five years of service on WRF's Research Advisory Council, and now he's a chair of WEF's new energy management task force. Uh, with this introduction, I would like to invite John uh, to give this presentation. Hey, thanks, Kesha. Appreciate it. Um, I do want to let folks know I did uh, put a copy of my dissertation that Kesha actually helped me out with. We did a fair amount of work together when we were pulling that together, but it goes through a lot of the detail on the sewer methane methods and how we did our analysis. So that's worth looking into. The one last thing that I wanted to say, and this is following up on a question that Oriel answered, um, IPCC says that if you're in the developed world, you can ignore sewer methane. Um, it, the reason is because if you're in the developed world and realize IPCC is talking to countries, they're telling countries how they should do their carbon footprint. And if you're in a place like the United States, we use so much fossil fuel for power and transportation that sewer methane is not significant. But when you get to smaller operations like a city government or a county government, or even smaller operations like a sewage utility, methane could be huge. And IPCC is not talking to them. The problem is that a lot of the protocols have adopted that IPCC said it doesn't They've interpreted that if you're in the developed world, you don't need to count it to mean that it doesn't exist. <laughs> and it's not the same. It's not the same answer. So um, I'm going to just tell you what we've done. So I've got a really quick overview here. I'm going to talk about sewer methane and some of the analysis we've done. Uh, we have an invention that we're working on piloting right now that could be a solution. And then uh, we've got a project that we're pulling together where we're soliciting involvement from utilities to have us develop a better method, estimate your sewer methane, and then to come up with a method for everybody. So we'll talk about that. So just a few things, this is, this is going back to some of the things that Oriol talked about. Um, so our methodology assumes that all of the methane is produced by slimes. There are septic systems and slow moving sewers where you deposit a lot of solids, but you know, sort of like a digester, if those solids aren't there for 10 days, they're not gonna be stimulating a bunch of growth. The slimes on the wall of the pipe stay there for a long, long time, and you can get those detention times where you're not wasting the methanogens faster than they're growing. So we assume it's produced by slimes. Uh, it's not carbon limited unless you're below about 50 milligrams per liter COD. Um, our assumption in our model is if methane is produced, it's emitted. Uh, Evelyn was talking earlier about methanotrophs. They exist, uh, but some of the research at University of Queensland and other, other places have had trouble finding them in significant quantities, either on the headspace of the sewers or in the bulk phase of the liquid. So um, it'd be nice if they were there, 
But um, so our assumption right now is it all gets emitted. This is a mass balance that is a way to think about the collection system. So one of the toughest parts, as Oriole mentioned, is uh, how much air is emitted from a, from a gravity sewer. It's really difficult. And there's been very few verification efforts because it's tough to know. The way to know is if you have a ventilated section, you know how much air flows coming here and you can measure the concentrations. And that's what we did as part of my PhD dissertation. Um, the rest of it is that it could be that the upstream area uh, brings methane into the foul air fan area that's exhausted. So we'll talk about some of these things. A sink could be that you wouldn't measure in this, could be fugitive methane going to the atmosphere. You wouldn't measure it with your foul air fan. It could also be dissolved methane that's still dissolved when it goes down the sewer. So the model estimates what's in the known systems, but a lot of regional sewers may have con contributions from local sewers who are bringing methane into their system as well that's emitted, emitted under their control. This goes to show you a similar situation. This is a, uh, it's about an 80 plus mile collection system that goes uh, into Washington, D.C. and is treated by D.C. water. This blue section is the section served by a foul air fan that we were able to measure the emissions from. Uh, what we did as part of this was to uh, essentially model the known collection system and estimate how much methane it would produce. All of these dead ends here aren't dead ends at all. They're collection systems upstream from local governments who feed to the system. So uh, we didn't know, but we did estimate how much methane was coming from here. So these are sample data and they're in the presentation. So I'd encourage you to look at them. The important here, the green concentrations are the measured methane concentrations that we saw at the foul air pan. And what you're seeing is that the concentrations here are you know, 350, 400, five, as high as 600, parts per million by volume. This is the winter testing. The scales are the same and it doesn't disappear. It's about half as much. And that correlates with some of the temperature things that uh, Oriole was talking about, where every 10 degrees C you get about half as much methane and that's proven by these graphs. Um, so these are interesting, but it is how we quantified the mass flux. So if we know how much methane is pulled out of this section of the gravity sewer or the blue one, and we modeled how much methane all of this pipe, and this is 60 miles of large diameter sewer. This is five miles that we were ventilating and generated a negative pressure on. And we know how much methane we got here. All of the methane produced in this entire system upstream with only half of the mass that we measured at this foul air fan. Now, what we did in the paper to correlate that or sort of close the mass balance was to assume that all of the rest was imported from these jurisdictional sewers. Now, the other thing that's almost certainly false is that there's no methane emissions anywhere upstream of this foul air fan. That just couldn't be true. So we think that our methodology, why it's the best, best methodology we could do, could be low by a factor of two to two and a half or three. And the idea is to try and develop a better methodology to quantify that. So despite the fact that we have a method um, and it's bigger than zero, uh, it's still probably low. This is another paper that I actually wrote with Kartik Chandran, who's done a lot more nitrous oxide work than I have. And it sort of reconciled it. But our estimate was for the U.S. that 24% of the scope one greenhouse gas emissions are from processed nitrous oxide, 14%, no, 6% are from effluent nitrous oxide, and sewer methane is almost half. So I think this is significant. It's a big deal. It's a bigger deal if you're in warm climates, and it's definitely a bigger deal if you have a lot of forced mains or surcharged pipes. How could we solve this? This is a project that we're working on now. If you have a force main coming into a pumping station or your treatment plant, the idea is to intercept it and to put in a siphon. And um, so 
the discharge level in the pumping station, the high point here could be, it's probably nine meters higher than the water grade. So this isn't a little vacuum, it's a big vacuum. And in order to prime this siphon, you have to pull all the headspace gas out. But at 0.1 atmospheres of absolute pressure, the sewage can't hold any, any dissolved gases. 90% of the saturated uh, content in a, an ideal regime would come out. So we're gonna test this and see how well it works. But this could be a solution. The other thing that you might be asking, well, won't this push back on my pumps? They're not designed to pump, you know, nine meters more static head, but it doesn't create that static head. The only energy required on this process is the energy to compress the head space gas from 0.1 atmospheres of pressure back to atmospheric pressure. And then when you do that, it's a siphon so that the pumps are still pumping against this hydraulic grade despite the fact that you're lifting the water an extra nine meters. This is our demonstration facility at Miami-Dade, and these are mostly just shown to share that we're making progress. This is the biogas harvester on the top where we expect for these, uh, for the pressures to be like 0.1 to 0.2 absolute uh, atmospheres of absolute pressure. These are the sampling points where we can measure what's in the gas, how effective was the sampling, measure the dissolved methane and other things going in and out. The only problem we've got, the whole thing's assembled, but this is a 54 inch diameter force main. Uh, what is that? That's probably at least a meter and a half, maybe a little more. Um, and this is the Venturi that we're trying to tie into. But in order to make this connection, they have to shut down this treatment plant treating 100 MGD. And I don't know what 100 meter MGD is in metric, but um, it's big. It's a big plant that serves most of the sewage from downtown Miami, Florida. So when they make that connection, we'll be able to test this out and see how it works. We have another project and I'm asking for volunteers. Um, and if you're interested, uh, get in touch with me, get in touch with Oriole, who's working on, working on this proposal with us and we'll get you included. But what the project would do is to have anybody who can do the work sample dissolved methane in their collection system. There's a method to do this. It does take more sophisticated analytical work, but um, if you're interested and wanna do this, we wanna know what the dissolved methane is. That's part of the mass balance. And then um, the idea is for us to develop two new methodologies. One of them is gonna be more area-based than the current methodology that we have. And then to compare these methods against, again, the Potomac Interceptor data and possibly one other new gravity sewer verification project that would be done at King County, which is Seattle, Washington. Anyway, we'd like to get your output files from your hydraulic sewer models at average conditions for each plant. And if we get 10 to 15 utilities, we're hoping to get hydraulic models for 30 to 50 sewer sheds. And what we're then able to do is to use this methodology that we develop to estimate what everybody's sewer methane is within their collection systems. We would then use those data to come up with a really simple methodology that would ask, and it could be in local protocols. It could ask, what's your temperature on average? How many people do you serve or some other size criteria? The part of this analysis will be, should we use population equivalent? Should we use miles of sewer or kilometers of sewer? Or should we use area of sewer shed? Those would all represent size or maybe even total flow. Whatever that is, we should go that way and figure out what it is. And then everybody could include sewer methane in their inventory. This is part of the problem. The folks who are willing to do the hard work and estimate it for their system don't want to say, oh, well, I've got this twice as much emission that nobody else is counting. So this would have let everybody and put it into, and actually ICLE is on our team. I know there's an ICLE Europe based in Germany. Uh, this is ICLE uh, North America who would include it as part of their protocols. What we're asking for is a $20,000 cash contribution, and this is US dollars. 
Um, what you get, though, is a detailed analysis and the equation for what each of your plants produce in sewer methane as a function of temperature and flow. Uh, it would allow you to contribute on helping us pick the best methodology and reviewing the data. It closes what I think is hands down the biggest gap in everybody's greenhouse gas emissions inventory, which gives you a better picture on what you can affect and what you can solve. And you also help everybody else add it to their sewer methane inventory. So this is a list of everybody on our team. <laughs> so Keshub is going to be doing some heavy lifting. Oriole is going to be doing some heavy lifting. And we've also included uh, Osborne Hunting Nielsen uh, with Alberg University, who has done the rest of the bulk of the sewer methane research in our industry. So um, I am excited about pulling this together. If you're interested, please get in touch with me soon. This is my email. You can also text me on my cell phone. So that information is available. Um, and with that, I'll open it for questions. If I have time for questions. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot, John, for a very nice informative presentation. Uh, we got a lot of questions regarding the sewer methane here. Uh, uh, please check uh, Q&A box. Uh, uh, a lot of questions uh, to John and Oriel. Pick one out that's your favorite, Kesha. Uh, oh, there's a question here about mitigating it. So ge generally, um, and this is aligned with what Oriel said, if you have a force main or you have sewers that are running full, which happens a lot. So if the pipe is entirely full, there's no oxygen in the headspace. There's no, and, you, and your slime layer goes all the way around. So if you, you could operate your sewer system by pulling down the hydraulic grades and making there be more gravity sewers, you would just produce less methane. And that's certain, but you sort of need to do this modeling and remodel it to quantify how much less methane there was. So Maybe there's a question here about the, the modeling equation. Um, there will be modeling equations. There is one in my PhD that I shared that you could use today, but there's also a long discussion about how it's probably low by a factor of two. Um, so you could use that. Uh, we're hoping to get different equations that would allow you to apply them to a collection system model. Well, there is one question also from asking about measures to reduce emission from sewers. Uh, definitely there's measures and uh, usually these measures, they involve the dosage of several different chemicals and different approaches. And they have been traditionally first aimed at control the sulfide because sulfide was, it, it creates problems like the toxicity, other problems and corrosion. And, but uh, in our research, we demonstrated that these compounds that they are currently those that could affect also the methanogens in different degrees and different uh, configurations, but there are definitely options that uh, to mitigate this. Yeah, well, but could, there is a long list of papers and uh, yeah. research on, uh, that, on that topic. There, there's a question from, yeah, the question, question from Jihan Lee. Yeah, do you find yeah. differences of gas generation quantity of methane depending on the sewer types? Uh, difference of gas generation quantity of methane depending on the sewer yeah. types. What, what, I don't understand exactly like sewer types. I what think the question is whether whether you produce same amount of methane from gravity sewers or uh, and rising mains or they are different. Uh, okay, that's a tricky question because as I said, in gravity sewers, and John also uh, highlighted this, is gravities are more complex than, than rising mains. And uh, so far, we don't have like enough data to have a proper comparison for this. You know, rising mains that have been studied and are easy to quantify. In gravity, we still have a lot of work to do on to, to be able to reply to this question. It does happen, but we don't know exactly the extent. And also, is that it depends a lot on the on the configuration of the sewer systems. If you have one sewer one sewer network with a lot of rising mains, then might the contribution of rising mains might be. Uh, so more more important, but if you have like more gravity sections and the wastewater flows naturally to the wastewater treatment plants, 
then you would have like less methane production. So it depends a lot of the of the geographical uh, extension and geographical distribution of your systems. Yeah, and we so Keshab and I did some modeling work on the difference and full flowing pipes as opposed to gravity sewers can produce, uh, I mean, big pipes uh, produce three to four times more methane if they're forced mains than gravity sewers. And um, small pipes could produce six to eight times more methane. So it really is. And when you think about the factors, uh, it, a lot of it is the area of the slimes, but a lot of it is that there's no oxygen transfer, right? You're not bringing oxygen into the sewage, which could inhibit it to some degree. Sure. Oh, and, and a lot of what, one other thing. So, go, go ahead, so one, other, one other thing that we wanted to check is if we do do those 30 to 50 sewer sheds, um, the other factor that I think goes into that is what do you think the percent of surcharged or forced mains are compared to the total sewer network? So when we did DC water, it's like 5% are surcharged or force mains. And what this would do is give us default numbers. If we looked at 30 sewer sheds, then we could say, oh, well, the default is 10% if you don't have any idea. But if you do have an idea, use your better estimate. And there are places, uh, especially like in Florida, where all the sewers are flat and all the ground is sand and full of water where they're completely full all the time. I mean, I think Miami-Dade's uh, collection system is probably 95% force mains. Not force mains, but full flowing pipes. <laughs> so depending on where it is, uh, that's, you know, that's the last factor, so it does matter. Now I know I just went way over, Keshub, so I'll be quiet. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there was a question regarding whether we can develop some equation, you know, uh, taking into account the factors like temperature and others. I think, George, uh, you've already answered this question. Uh, we definitely have yeah, the equation and, that and, takes into account and, the temperature and, and, and other things. And, and, and yeah. by the way, the guy who developed the equations is Kesha. So mm -hmm. there you go. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we got definitely have got our equations there to estimate methane emission from sewers under different conditions. So I'll I'll start. I, I think I'll go to the top and see what questions remains to be answered. Uh, the one we have got is: uh, Do you have any fugitive emissions results information for membrane type BUU? Uh, I know who's the best best person to answer this question. Any volunteers? Uh, I did some measurements on membrane. Uh, be, be, uh, I guess upgrading units, but um, unfortunately, I cannot share data yet because uh, they have to be compiled first. I cannot share uh, uh, yeah. specific data from specific utilities uh, uh, and. So these will be com uh, compiled in two, one or two years, I think. Uh, so for the no, no numbers, sorry. Thank you. There's another question: What concentration of methane is generally required to so that it is its use is feasible? Uh, so, does anyone has got any answer to this? Uh, I don't have an exact answer, but the the, the gas that the um, units that produce from, I, I think about if, if you could use gas well, um, to burn it if, if you get quite low. Uh, it's just a matter of um, putting your equipment right, so to speak. Sorry about my English. Um, so, so you could burn quite low, uh, low um, uh, gas quality. Thank you again. Uh, 
Okay, the higher AV gives higher pro production of methane. That's, uh, I think, Oriel already answered that question, right, yes. Oriel? Yeah. Yeah, so that's done. Uh, what could be the best technologies to delivering our on-site disposal system and waste water? Uh, I'm not sure if this is this question is related to the, the topic today. Uh, and I don't think there's a there's a one answer to this question as well. It, it will depend upon the individual situations. Uh, okay, there's another question here about sewers. Any recommendation? on how sewer system should be designed to mitigate methane and S2S production or to capture it so it can be mitigated. Mm. Yeah, good one. Well, the problem is that most of the sewers are already there. Like we, we, we have to work with what's on the other ground and it's, sometimes it's difficult to, to implement things. For the new sewer systems, we could uh, incorporate sections like exact, exactly like John mentioned in the, in the project solutions where the siphons would be able to get this biogas outside and even before it goes uh, uh, and in effect, so it gets released into the atmosphere. But that's for new construction and things need to be considered upfront and planned with enough time to apply it. For the rest of the sewers that it's uh, been there, it's, uh, it's quite limited and we have like a very limited leverage of uh, of places to work, yeah. Well, and I, hey, one of the ways, yeah. Uh, go ahead, go ahead. Just a second. Yeah. I mean, I do like the idea of this biogas harvester idea and the vacuum depressurization to collect the gas. Um, one of the challenges will be if you do collect that gas, what do you do with it? So, um, and we don't know yet because we haven't pilot tested it, but our impression is we're, we could collect a lot of methane. But what we're also going to collect is tons of carbon dioxide. <laughs> carbon dioxide is so much more soluble. And if it turns out I'm going to get 90% of all the dissolved gas, my gas could be 75% carbon dioxide. And it might only be 10% methane. And if that's the case, I can't burn it. <laughs> so maybe I want to be next to my plant with my digesters when I get that gas. Mm. And then I could burn it with the digester gas. And then it all becomes CO2, which is good as we could do with it. Um, but the other thing that I think about that, and this gets to where are we going to be doing in 50 years or 30 years, um, I think that device, if you put it between your aeration basins and your clarifiers, allow us to extract biogenic CO2, put it back into spent oil fields, for less energy than any other way to get CO2. It would be a lot easier than pulling it out of the atmosphere. So, you know, one of the things I think resource recovery facilities are going to be doing is sequestering biogenic CO2. Now, it's not a priority like reducing our methane emissions, which is worth a lot more today. But um, I, I think those kinds of systems could be used to get us there. Ooh. Thank you. Uh, Avalon, there's one question to you, the very last question. Can you please have a look? Uh, second last question, I think, yeah. Uh, very interesting. Um, how does methane mitigation affect N2 mitigation? I would say they are not that much connected because we see that main methane sources are all related to the digestion and mainly to the storage. Uh, anaerobic conditions, whereas N2O production is related to nitrification and denitrification. So not uh, anaerobic conditions, but aerobic and anoxic conditions. So in that sense, we're lucky. Well, lucky in the sense that at least uh, doing something for one doesn't harm the other. Um, we could think further, maybe we'd find some, some uh, connections anyway, but uh, at least they do not negatively interfere at first sight. That's what I would say. No. Well, uh, I, yes, please, John. While and on there, Evelyn, we did measure. Um, so the protocols say assume 1% of your produced biogas methane is released to the atmosphere. And yet all the digesters we're designing today are fixed cover. They've got alarms on the relief valves that, you know, it doesn't emit gas. But where almost all of that gas is emitted is when you dewater the when you dewater the biosolids. Yes, that's what I showed. And, and I think and I think that's great. 
but we got to do something about that. Mm -hmm. So if we can recover that, um, that's something you could do today. Yeah, well, uh, an obvious you? one, it was also asked in the, in the Q&A, I asked it in a written way. Uh, we saw indeed that in the plant uh, that I showed, most of the emissions from the anaerobic treatment were related to the dewatered sludge storage. If you could cover that, and uh, that's too uh, diluted to burn directly, but you could use, but it's still a relatively low flow rate. So you could send it to the biogas engine, use it as combustion air. And in that sense, get rid of part of it at least. Yes, definitely. Uh, uh, that's a low hanging fruit, indeed. We should yeah, do no. that. Yeah, we should do the things that are easy, right? Yes, well, uh -huh. and that uh, gain, uh, bring a lot of gain and not so much extra costs, probably. Of course, yeah, it depends how far your biogas engine is from the dewatered sludge storage. Is it already covered and so on? There's a question in relation to post digestion storage. So, uh, of, of the second last question again. If anyone can answer that question. In post digestion storage, is there an influence of mixing the tank or not mixing it? Well, mixing for sure will, uh, will create more. Um, uh, gas liquid transfer um, probably not, not bring in a lot of oxygen. If you would have oxygen, you would prevent the methane formation. It will not be sufficient for that. It will be sufficient to strip the dissolved methane, so it's not a good thing. Also, what we've seen that in some um, digester, uh, digester state storage tanks, you have a crust. And if there's a crust formation, this is also advantages because it um, yeah, uh, counteracts the, the stripping. Yeah, thank well, you. And, and I would oh, encourage I think... anybody. I would encourage anybody who's odor controlling their digester, digested biosolid storage tank to make it a digester gas atmosphere and collect the methane off the tank. Mm -hmm. Don't add air to it, right? <laughs> make it another digester. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, we are. I think we don't have much time left now. We, last question, John. There's one question on sewer. The second last question again. Uh, can you please have a look? Yeah, so, so I think the off-gassing from force mains is, I think that solution that I've presented is a good one, uh, the vacuum harvester. And I expect that that's going to work just fine on almost any force main. The, the other thing about that is if it turns out that I remove 80 to 90% of the dissolved gases, there's a really good chance I'm not going to have odor problems from sulfide in my headworks. <laughs> which wouldn't that be a great thing? Or maybe that my headworks equipment will last longer than 10 years. So, you know, I think there, there are uh, coincidental benefits for some of these things. And I think we're going to do it. And the neat thing is it's not a widget you buy, it's pipe. <laughs> and we're trying this Sorry, John, I think, I think we, have to, we have to stop here now. Yeah. We're running out of time. Okay. Uh, okay. So now a few announcements before we wrap up this uh, webinar. Uh, Old Water Congress, uh, 15, 11 to 15 September, 2022 in Denmark, Copenhagen. Uh, registration is now open and early bird registration discount ends on 30th of June. So please register before 30th of June to, to take advantage of the, the discount. Uh, uh, and also, for well, this, we got a, another announcement. Uh, this seminar, uh, this webinar was part of the masterclass series organized by IWA Climate Smart Utilities Initiatives. That was third in this series. And the last webinar of the masterclass series will be organized in a few months' time. Uh, that will be mostly on mit mitigation uh, of greenhouse gas emission from urban water systems. Uh, that will be held before uh, the World Water Congress, but the date has not been finalized. Please keep an eye on the announcement. Okay. With this, I think we, 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 are, we, have, we have come to the end of this webinar. I would like to thank all the presenters, all the participants uh, for the li lively discussions, presented very good presentations here. Uh, and I would like to thank IWA team uh, to, uh, to allow us to, to, uh, to take this opportunity to talk uh, about the greenhouse gas, uh, especially methane uh, emission from our water system. Uh, and also would like to thank all the supporting team uh, from IWA. Uh, 
Okay, wherever you are, good morning, good afternoon, good night. Uh, it's bye from all the, the panel members uh, from this uh, webinar series. Thank you.